Well, hello, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. As you can see, I'm not Sarah Moore Peach. Uh, if you're watching Sarah, thank you for the phone call a few hours ago. Uh, Sarah has lost her voice, which is a bit ironic because we're going to talk about a lot about voices today. And Sarah, I hope you get well enough for the Royal Philharmonic Society Awards on Thursday because yes. we need you in fine fettle for those. Welcome, Thomas Krastoff, thank one you. of the greatest leader singers of our time, so much associated with this house, so much loved here in London, and welcome to the audience online. If you'd like to ask some questions of Thomas, uh, please uh, send them in uh, digitally to us, and we will present them at the end of the talk, and also we'll take some questions live from the floor. But first of all, Thomas, just to say uh, thank you so much for the masterclass, which so many people have been writing about online on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram in the last few days, and for your insights and all those young musicians, singers and pianists who learned so much from you, and for your Thank humor you. and for your very erudite uh, reflection. Thank you. It, it, it really is a wonderful thing, and that, the, the joy of, of this Wigmore Hall digital platform is that that is there forever, as is this interview, as this interview will be so just to remind everybody that you made your uh, debut here in 1996. Do you remember what it was like to come through the door to this? Audience? Well, first of all, the first thing that I, that I got to know was that everybody, every singer said, oh, this is the most famous recital hall in the world. And, uh, uh, and, and I remember that I had before a concert in St. John, one of these lunch concerts, and, and everybody said, oh, well, this is nice, but wait if you go to Wigmore Hall. <laughs> and I remember that, that um, I think, I hope I'm not wrong, it was a very well-visited concert. Yes, it was a full house. There were a lot yeah. of people, which was really very, very beautiful, and... Um, I think I never sang a recital which I left not touched. It was a very special relationship between the audience and the pianist and me after and before and during the recitals. I loved this hall and I was incredibly nervous the first time, of course, and, um, but it got better over the years. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you... you retired in a way from classical singing in 2012 mm. for, for all sorts of reasons, but you're doing, you're doing a lot of jazz uh, at the moment. And I noticed in, in, in your latest record, Nice and Easy, uh, 2018, the voice is, is a bit deeper, it's a bit richer. It is, are, are you more relaxed? Now deep it was always, yeah. and we put the keys of the song. Well, the beautiful thing in jazz music is Nobody cares about keys, <laughs> really. I mean, if you do a Schubert song in a different key, there are always colleagues and journalists who say, you cannot do that, this is holy stuff. And Schubert would turn around uh, in, his, in his grave when he would knew that, uh, and I said, don't worry, he, he, he knew. But um, um, so, we tried to find keys where the voice is really extremely relaxed. And um, this long voice I always had. Mm. I always had, thank God, no problems in the high range. And I never had problems in the low range. And um, well, then during the time with whiskey, cigarettes, and <laughs> women. Indeed. <laughs> no, I'm wrong. <laughs> well, women was not the case, but uh, no. Um, uh, the voice, thank God, normally if you become older, the voice is becoming higher. And I didn't lost this low register, which is really very nice. And um, so we put the key in the very comfortable um, way. And this is why it sounds so relaxed. Which is wonderful. Thank you. Let's, let's talk a little bit about that your unique journey to, to becoming a singer. Um, at one point, you were, you were almost excluded from studies because, because you couldn't play the piano. Just, just 
how everything happened? Your, it started really very early. Yes. I mean, um, there are, we just found, we, we changed the house uh, with my wife and daughter. And uh, so you have to pack everything from, from one apartment to the next. So we found then suddenly uh, old tapes when I was three years old singing German pop songs um, when I was three. So that was 1962. And, uh, and I really was surprised by myself that I could sing in that age absolutely in pitch. So there was not really a lot of wrong notes. And, um, so you, you were an eighthly musical, clearly. Yeah, yeah, and I grew up in a family. Um, my father studied singing too, but his speaking voice was even a little bit more like that. And so I grew up with music. I grew up with Fischer Dieskau, Franz Krass, um, and uh, Peter Piers, and all these kind of great singers. And um, so I was really, yeah, I couldn't even imagine my childhood without music. And thank God I had parents, and especially my father, who was very supportive to me because he recognized the talent. And of course, when, when he went to um, uh, a radio station and said, I have a very talented son who wants to sing, and telling them that he's disabled, everybody was saying, yeah, yeah, of course, he's disabled and he's a talented son. Mm. Um, so n nobody could really imagine that there, there was uh, this talent and the disability. And finally, we found Sebastian Peschko, who was at that time the boss of the classical chamber music department of the North German Broadcasting. And he said at the beginning when my father called him, oh, okay, 10 minutes, I have 10 minutes. Okay, so we went there and I sang everything. I was 13 at that age, at that year. And so it was not 10 minutes, it was nearly two hours he worked with me. And um, he said, well, this is not a talented child. It is, this guy is music. And so he, um, put me to my teacher, Charlotte Lehmann. Who's an and exceptional, I've had the pleasure of meeting her. Yes. Many times, exceptional person. Yes, yeah. and she said, I don't know what is the result of all that, but something in this voice is interesting me really very much. So we started to work, and I worked with her 17 years, and uh, it was a quite successful relationship. <laughs> So, um, and, and, and did she prepare you for the, for the competition in Germany in 84 and for the ARD yes, in 88? So these yeah. are the two competitions. It was really very funny, in, especially map. in 88 in Munich at the ARD competition. She came to every round, warmed me up, and, and at the last performance that was with orchestra in the uh, Herkulesaal in, in Munich in the residence, um, she traveled home before uh, knowing the result and, and listening to me. Uh, and she said, Tommy, I'm, I'm relatively sure you will win that. And she was right. I won this competition, which was at that time um, really sensational because I was one of the rare German winners of this mm. competition. And I had at that year the only first prize um, because there are also not only voice, there are also different instruments um, every year. And that was like a rocket. I mean, at that time, everybody wants to make concerts with the ARD winner. And I got relations to London Symphony, to Vienna Philharmonic, Berlin Philharmonic, and that was really the rocket which helped a lot to go on and having great concerts. You mentioned in the year 2000, I found an interview as I was Googling very quickly in the last hour. He asked prepare. me before if I remember, I said, 19 years ago, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you said, you said something that, that resonated because I remember, I remember, you said this, that, that we can see your disability, but of course, we all have our own his, hidden disabilities. And oh, one, one journalist said I, 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 that I am, very sarcastic, and I didn't 
mean it like this because I said sometimes it's good if you see the disability of mm. a person and for me if somebody is mainly disappointed about life and, and yearning about I have not enough money in my life and I'm sick and I have this and I have that and I said maybe this kind of disability is much mm. worse than mine. And there, there are hidden disabilities in, in some of our singers. There's a lot of performance anxiety, depression. Yeah, that I never had. So yes. I must say, you're, stage you're very frightening, happy. I was... But we see a lot of thank that God here. never. And, and how, would, how do you advise young or established singers, you know, given that, that you've had to cope with so much, you know... There's only one advice, the John. There's yeah. only one advice. Be prepared. Absolutely, yeah. Be best prepared and go on stage, then there is no reason to be frightened. If you can trust your voice and if you can trust what you are doing at that moment, um, then there's no need to be frightened because the audience is not biting. They are coming to your concerts because they want to listen to you and they want to share the music and the beauty of music and, and they want to see how you are Express, uh, expressing the words and the music. And, um, um, but I know colleagues who are really very, very much stage frightened, but I never had this disease. Thank God. We, we in this hall regard the lead and art song as one of the great treasures of the repertoire. You've been a great person to, to advocate for that. What attracted you to the lead and, and, and why did you make it so much part of what you do and what you still do in terms of the competition and all the rest? Well, when I heard, when I was younger, the first time Fischer Dieskau in my life, uh, not live, but on records, there was something um, which I loved really very much. It was the, the, to, to use the voice in such a colorful way and suddenly I realized that there is for me not one instrument in the world piano or violin or, or anyone a violin sounds like a violin but you have so many opportunities in in showing emotions with your voice anger happiness I, uh, irony um, uh, um, um, aggression, beloved. Well, the, well, there are so many different ways and and possibilities of of, of emotional expression in this instrument. And um, I loved the intimacy of 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 recitals. And you how, have the how pianist. How did you approach the poetry, for instance? How yeah, I, I just wanted to mention it. Yeah. Um, the combination of intimacy between pianist, singer, music, and these wonderful poetries. Um, it's like, for me, I always felt, not only as a singer, I felt also like an actor to, to act in these three, four minute um, miracles, compositions, a world, yeah, that you sing it in a way that an audience can see a tree, can smell, uh, 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 nature suddenly that you that you are so expressive, and that that you are able to to create this kind of imagination of a poetry um, that that you never has uh, have as an opera singer. Mm. Well, you're it's, so you're so exposed because it's, yeah. it's just you and and, yes. and the pianist. Yes, and sometimes we singers have to prepare maybe twenty twenty four songs. For, for a recital to get us across two hours, that's probably harder than, than learning a role yes. for an opera. Yes. And the stamina you need. And, by the way, you are your own director. I mean, with, with what kind of directors, especially at the moment, young singers has to deal with. <laughs> uh, uh, you can be, as a singer, in the meanwhile, being happy if, if a director is even able to read scores or knowing the piece. And um, here you are your own director. You create the program, you create 
Um, maybe also you make a program and you choose the poetries, and this is, yeah, not comparable to any other um, genre in the music world, and I love that really very, very much. And, of course, through your competition, your competition is very much about the partnership, the duo between voice and piano. You've worked with, with many of the world's greatest pianists, yes. concert pianists, and many song accompanists. Solo pianists, too. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Andra Schiff, and, yes. and Daniel Barenboim and others. Yes. Marta Agerich, yes. Yevgeny Kissin, Lang Lang, who was like a, how do you call this, um, this, this, this yellow thing that you put in your, in your bathtub with you? A swan? Uh, well, it's a rubber duck, swan? I Swan? A, a rubber duck. Where you wash you oh, oh, yourself uh, with the little holes inside? A sponge, a sponge. sponge. <laughs> sorry. Oh, taking in My English, I'm sorry. Yes. He was taking in all your he information. He was really like yes. a sponge. He I mean, to I, 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 okay. yeah. It was, and by the way, it was not, not, not a concert hall, it was Carnegie Hall, where we played to the 17th or 75th birthday of Marilyn Horn. And it was a kind of gala, and we played there, and, and he said in his in his Chinese English, tell me everything, everything which I do wrong. I said, excuse me, if I could play even one note like you do, I cannot give you any advice. And um, I remember, because that was really funny, I remember that I did with him at the Verbier Festival an interview, and the journalist asked Lang Lang, is there any piano piece which gives you any kind of technical problems? And he looked at him, smiled, and said, no. <laughs> and I said at the same time to the journalist, oh, well, me, minimum 173. So, <laughs> but he was right. He has no limits. And, um, yeah, and to play with, with musical, talented solo pianists, it's amazing. With Jean-Yves Thibautet I played, and we had a lot of incredible fun. But it, it yes. doesn't just have to be those those great names. Our usual song pianists are so important. Yeah, I mean, and I worked with Justus Stein, with whom I played here a lot of concerts. Indeed, yeah. He is not only a wonderful lead pianist, he's also a very, very close friend. And um, I always needed people at my side whom I like. I couldn't mm -hmm. play with also some lead pianists uh, who had a great name, but I couldn't stand. So for me, this personal <laughs> partnership relation work, yes. was always very, very important. I cannot make great music and great evenings with a pianist in my side that I do not like. I cannot. You just mentioned a birthday celebration at, at Carnegie Hall. Of course, part of the reason we're here today is because this is the month of your, your 60th birthday, and we mm -hmm. wanted to celebrate that here at mm. Wigmore Hall with the masterclass and with this Yeah, it was on the 9th November, the 9th, which... Big party. Which is, no. But no, a, I had a not a big concert, party. Yeah. I think the party at the wall, where, where in the past the wall was in Berlin, was bigger than my birthday party. <laughs> um, but I remember 30 years ago when, when, when uh, I became 30, I didn't even realize that the wall broke because I had guests in my apartment in Hanover, where I lived at that time. And, um, and, and next morning when we cleaned up my apartment, I put the television on and said, this is a strange film. There are people walking on the wall. <laughs> and so I didn't realize, and, and it was, well, thank God that was a very positive date. I mean, the last mm -hmm. date where you think as a German um, artists was the 9th November in 1938 when all the Jewish synagogues burned in Germany and uh, of course as a young, I was born in 1959 um, and uh, to imagine that, that I would um, um, passive at a peaceful revolution in my country with this history made me honestly, for some days, very, very proud. It was really very amazing. Let's talk about teaching, because mm -hmm. that's something that we associate you very much with now. Um, the difference between a good teacher and a bad teacher, because in the master class the other day, you were, you were correcting some technique. You had picked up on a few things. And, but and to, I have to say, I asked them before, because normally, 
I'm not doing this generally in front of an audience. Mm. I always ask before we go yeah, out, yeah. am I allowed to work on your technique? Yeah, excuse me. And uh, you, you reminded them that looking in the mirror every day as they rehearse, as they practice, is just as important as, as the time they spend in the room with the teacher. It's very hard to look in the mirror all the time. It depends how you look. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what shall I say? I mean, very often I realize, for example, I don't know how it is here in, 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 in Great Britain. Um, in Germany, the law is saying um, the students have to have one and a half hour per week lesson, lessons, which is ridiculous for me. Um, and they think, many students are really thinking if they have this lesson, this is the main important thing they have to do to prepare for this lesson. And I said, no, the main work is what you are doing every day at home. Minimum uh, two, three, sometimes four hours. It depends what kind of concerts you have. I remember when I had a time in my life where I had four jobs. I worked at a radio station. I worked for a private radio station um, um, as a speaker, and, and I had my lessons with my vocal teacher, Charlotte Lehmann, and I worked very intensively with her husband, uh, musicology, music uh, sociology, so uh, sociology, so we worked um, on, on, on many things, and, and I really worked sometimes, some days, really three, four hours. And by the way, every other person had a weekend. I had concerts at a weekend. So, um, um, and sometimes I, I think if I see the young generation um, today, um, if, I, if they had to mention this kind of amount of work, they would be under an oxygen tent. Mm. <laughs> but, but do you think young, young singers actually realise the dedication, the commitment, that you almost have to put your life on hold if you really want to make it? It's a very difficult world. It's very competitive. Not only how you sing, unfortunately, how you look as well in, in the opera houses now in terms of casting. So much work has to go into all of that. Yes. Well, I think if you are not burning for this... Um, profession, uh, you shouldn't do it. Because um, I said once to one of my students, if you do not want to sing in every tram or bus or everyday life, then don't do it. You, you have to burn for this profession because it is so difficult. I mean, even in Germany, which is an Austria, which are the symbols for theaters and opera houses and everything, the situation is getting worse because, um, um, well, the politicians are not saying we are closing one theater. They say we make a fusion between two theaters, which mm -hmm. is meaning the same thing. Yeah. But do you think there are too many, in a way, that there are too many students because there are not enough places even in choruses yes. and choirs? And, and but I'm telling that even, I, I mean, I started my professorship uh, and teaching in Detmold, which is a small city in the northwest of Germany, but a very famous music university. And even when I started there, I was 36, um, I said, it cannot be that we are really um, putting so many students in our university knowing that maybe four, six, percent of them mm. are really getting a good job. And do you think teachers are actually telling them early enough that they should be looking at other alternatives? No. I do, but um, I know that not everybody is my opinion because it has a lot to do with ego. Mm. Because if you take students and you realize maybe after a year that the voice that you heard at the, at the audition was much more promising than after a year, um, I think you should have, well, we have to be honest enough to tell them 
maybe it was a wrong decision mm. and and um, and i mean it's a huge responsibility yes. well, that you don't you want have to wake as a up teacher. you don't want them to wake up at the age of 40 yes. in well, poverty well, that, yeah then it's too late yeah yes so we have to be honest as teachers and and um, i always say to my own students i'm not here in this institute um, to be beloved i'm here to work with you and to prepare you for a very difficult but beautiful profession. Yeah? If you don't love me, it's fine. But, but if you can say, I learn a lot from him, that's fine. Yeah? That's, my, that's my job. Yeah? I want to be beloved by my daughter and my dog and my wife. That's the main <laughs> And my friends. Of course. But not, students do not really need to love me. Let's talk about the, the Das Lied competition, mm -hmm. uh, which you founded 2007, maybe even earlier. Mm -hmm. Your competition and your house was my hero. I had the idea when, when I knew that here is this competition going on, uh, going on and realized, and I said, I want to have, well, the, the, the original idea was um, I wanted to create um, a competition in Berlin to honor Fischer Dieskau, because there wasn't one. And I called him and I said, no, I don't give my name. And he was a little rough, and, uh, which I honestly didn't understand, because it was honestly really to honor him. Mm. And I had never the idea to give this competition my name, because it's not about me. So mm. finally, I said, OK, then let's give this competition the name international lead competition, so that's neutral and has nothing to do really with me, and I'm the artist director of this, um, of this competition. And I wanted definitely to be responsible for the collection of a nice and, and great jury. And I think now, uh, after the, well, since 2009, every two years, it's, it was the fifth Think so, competition, yes, yes. Yeah. six, and um, I, I, for me that was very important that I see every two years people that I loved uh, and love and, and who are really perfectly working also together in the jury. And I think finally uh, we found it with these people um, and I'm allowed to say that we had this year also the honor that I had the honor to be a member of the jury which was working perfectly together this year. It was really very moving and, and we laughed a lot. Uh, not over the singers, but uh, <laughs> behind the scenery. So, yeah. And, uh, and we created really, I think, a lot of these people who were in the final are making really a very beautiful Career. I remember the first one was the second prize, Tobias Bernd, who is doing a wonderful career as a Bach singer and lead singer. And, um, and to mention other names, well, they are going their way and um, successfully, which is making me very happy. And, and um, there were only journalists who say it's now together here with Wigmore Hall, one of the most important song uh, competitions worldwide, which is great. I love it. Why do you think it is, at the moment in this house, we're able to promote about 90 song recitals a year? Uh, in Vienna, in Berlin, in Paris, in New York, we're lucky if we get 12 or 14 song recitals. It's a very difficult thing to do here in London, to promote that, that, Everywhere. that many song recitals. Everywhere. Uh, but why, why aren't the German-speaking territories doing more for for the lead? First of all, we have the problem that in schools um, it's not really, uh, there are no teachers anymore who are teaching poetry. Um, because they said it's old fashioned, now they like these kind of <laughs> and, and with, with words where, where you have a lot, of, a lot of, well, as more dirty words you have in these music, as more popular it is sometimes, I think. And to have this wonderful relation to, to 
old poetry, and sometimes, I mean, if, if you only look even to Bible texts, how modern they are for serious songs, for example, mm. uh, or, or talking about uh, love. Just, can I just interrupt there? Yeah. Your, your four serious songs that Eustace has just been named as one of the great recordings of all time, is that correct? In the gramophone In the magazine. gramophone magazine, yes. 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 And, um, and I think that is one of the reasons. And, um, and, and people who are organizing concerts are not taking risks anymore mm. to say, I mean, Berlin had a very regular series of recitals um, um, promoted by, by Konzertdirektion Adler in, in Berlin, which is a huge. Now they have none anymore. And if the Philharmonie, for example, and the Society of the Berlin Philharmonic would not um, create some rare, some recitals, we wouldn't have anything. Mm. Yeah? But there are some, like Cologne Philharmonie, like Konzerthaus in Vienna, yes. Dortmund. Yeah. Um, um, but Essen. the numbers are relatively small. Yeah, and, uh, but, but they do. And, and I completely disagree if I see Young, younger singers, for example, um, Julian Pregadien, the son from Christoph Pregadien, is really doing a lot of small uh, festivals for recital. Or Alexander Fleischer, who is my assistant and pianist in my university, a wonderful young pianist who also, by the way, is a winner of, of my competition as a pianist. Um, is, is having a, a, a close to Mannheim a, a recital festival. Daniel Heide, who played yesterday here, um, has um, a small but, but, but really prestigious little small festival at the, at the, uh, close to Weimar. Um, by the way, if you never were there, this is really, really, really worth, uh, worth to, to go there and visit Weimar. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful city. And um, so I disagree completely if people are saying recitals are a dying mm. genre. Well, we don't, I we don't, don't agree with that, sir. I think so. We need really um, protagonists, are you saying that? Um, uh, who have something to say. I, I said in an interview, a beautiful voice for me in a recital is after 40 minutes boring. If you are not able to transfer um, the poetry and, and the texts and the imagination, then something is really lost. And I think that we sometimes have a little bit too much, too many singers, females and boys, who think if I have a beautiful voice, that's enough. I don't think so. It goes back to the text and the poetry of and that, that intimacy yeah. of communication, yeah. which, I mean, is, yeah. which you get better at as, as you move along. Yeah, I, I mean, this is yeah. what, uh, what I said um, the day before yesterday. Um, um, I, I was one in, once in the concert, um, for everybody who was not there, um, who sang an aria, Philip, Ella Jamai Momo from Don Carlos, which is a wonderful, wonderful aria. And it has a four or five minute orchestra introduction. And there was really a guy, <laughs> um, a young bass who thought he is the guy, who really was standing in front of the orchestra for five minutes like this. <laughs> so I said after that performance to him, but excuse me, you cannot do that if the people, the audience is not understanding why you hear which is a very tragic motive. And, and if you are not doing this, because the first words are saying, she never loved me. And instead of, <laughs> yeah, then something is really lost. And it's an opera, I think, honestly the same. Why Maria Callas was so, incredible successful. The voice was not what I would call extremely pretty, but when, when, you, when you only see Tosca in this, in this genius uh, performance with, with, with um, what is the baritone? Uh, um, 
Tadei. Giuseppe Tadei. Uh, incredible, yeah? She was, she was Tosca with all these anxiety and, and aggression and, I mean, never forget when I heard this the first time and she was looking on the dead one and said, why? I mean, wow, that was shocking, yeah? I mean, you cannot do this in the recital because a lot of older people would get <laughs> with a heart attack. No, but, but for me, it is so honestly so important that you as an audience can see in my face yes. what's going on. Yeah, if I sit, even if I would do the interview here with a face like this and, and no, expressive, no expression, that's it's nothing about. So we have to be very intense as artists here on stage. So since 2012, you've been singing a lot of jazz. You sang in jazz clubs as a student Yes. It back in back in Berlin. Yes, without knowledge of my teacher. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and was this something that you really wanted to incorporate into your repertoire as time went At on? At that time, no. Okay. It was fun. I loved the music. Honestly, I I still do. I love it, and I mean jazz, not this kind of free jazz where. <laughs> I mean, really, um, this, is, this is where we're talking as with my musicians very often about, let's choose songs which are nice, which we like, and then let's see what we can do with this. So uh, I'm more in, in this um, tradition of Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, um, and 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 other other great great singers mm -hmm. and not this kind. I'm I'm not doing jazz to create a new style or something like this. I do jazz because I love it, and uh, and I have fun when I'm doing it. And um, uh, after the after the uh, date ten years ago when my brother died with 52 on lung cancer. I lost my voice for two years, and I had to take a decision. Shall I go back and being on a level where I maybe say, mm, or, um, well, at that, at that moment, um, I didn't even realize to go back in any way mm -hmm. as a singer. I remember, yes. But then the voice came back, and I thought, what really would you like to do if you had not the classical music? And I said, well, the best thing would be to, to play with a small group jazz, because I loved it. And I learned, by the way, a new instrument, the microphone, um, <laughs> which is a new instrument if you use it well. And, um, and I was very, very lucky to find incredible um, European first-class musicians who said, Tommy, we want to play with you. And we play in a very small um, um, group. It's only piano, bass, and drums. And um, and um, they they gave me the azul <laughs> in their group. And and now in the meantime, we are playing nearly eight, nine years together. And not only in halls like this here, we are playing in. Uh, in very, very big halls. We just played in the Festspielhaus in Baden-Baden, which has 2,500 people. We played in the Cologne Philharmonie, which has 2,000 people. And we played in the Konzerthaus in Vienna, which has also nearly 2,000 people. And every concert was sold out. Maybe it's because of my age and said, one last time, we want to see him. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, you but I want, honestly, yeah. my first limit that I set for myself is 65, because then I'm 50 years on stage, and it would be great to have that. That would be 50 years on stage is quite a number which I would love quite remarkable. to realize. Yes. You, you have the most beautiful speaking voice. Thank you. And we have heard you here uh, as the narrator in, in, with the Belcher Quartet in Haydn's Seven Last Words. Yes. Are you doing more of that sort of thing? Yes, I just did with Manuel Walzer, who yes. 
performed here also Schöne Magellone. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I will do that with Tobias Band um, next year, three or four concerts. Um, I did, by the way, here two years ago in in the Albert Hall, the narrator of, of Gurelieder yes, from Schönberg very well, with yes. Simon Rettel and um, and I'm doing a lot of readings now and um, I just finished a production of a child book. I read a child book which will come out as a CD. And, uh, there was a bit of Shakespeare too, wasn't there at some point? Yes. And um, I'm doing, yeah, a lot of of readings, we did a production of three recordings for children with classical music, which won a youth award. And um, it's a classical um, work, like Italian Symphony from Mendelssohn, and there was a writer who um, wrote a story around this, um, this piece. And I did also An American in Paris and Dvorak Symphony Out of the New World, which we did. And um, beautiful stories, and I had the honor to read it. And yeah. That's wonderful. Yes. Well, Thomas, we, we've, we have 10 minutes left, so we're going to take some questions. Yes. But just before we do that, to, to wish you many happy returns again, to thank you for your advocacy of the lead uh, and for everything that you do and for everything that you've done for this hall. And, With pleasure. Uh, and for being such a, a force for good and uh, a shining beacon in a world that's full of trouble. Uh, when we meet and encounter people like you, it lifts us greatly and, and it's an honor to know you and to sit on the stage with you. Before, so, you. before you give applause, I want to say if every concert hall would have had such incredible, ambitious, nice, friendly, beautiful people like John, uh, the world would be much better also. <laughs> so this relation makes me very, very happy. John is every two years also in my competition, which is honoring my competition. And I like this guy so very much. And we are, in the meantime, really very close friends, which is really very beautiful, and um, so now you can applaud if you want. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to have some questions from the floor. Um, let's get some microphones moving. And uh, there's a hand here. Thank you very much. It's been interesting. It's been suggested that some German song repertoire or leader or in arias, a better suited to a German voice. Can you do me a favor? Yeah. I do not really understand. If you put the microphone away and speak up, it would be a little easier. I'm sorry, because the resonance here is... It's been suggested that uh, in some German song repertoire or arias, or take for example the ring cycle, that that's better suited for German singing voices than non-German. To be very honest, I think a good singer has to be able to sing everything. That means Wagner and, uh, and well, I would say the problem at the moment is that a lot of young singers are forcing themselves too early, much too early, into this Wagner repertoire. And it was Nobody else than Fischer Dieska who told me at a telephone call, never start to sing Wagner before you turned 40, mm. which I didn't uh, because of his advice. And I think he's very wise, uh, right because um, all the muscles have to be completely well and prepared and grown that you are able to sing this kind of repertoire. And you have to be very careful I mean, these vocal cords are very tiny little muzzles, and if you are not careful, um, well, then you sound like Louis Armstrong. Okay. So <laughs> it's good to be careful, but I wouldn't say there is a special repertoire. Um, I always say Bach Mozart is medicine for the voice, mm -hmm. and it doesn't depend on any kind of special music. We've got a question here in the front. Is this answering your question? Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Um, I, I am a humble 
philosopher, and I know very little about music and leader. I normally would say sing songs, but then I was told they are leader, and I was told they are chansons and so on. But, but I do find my life is enriched by coming to hear the leader and indeed the chamber music and so on. But of course, many, many people don't. And of course, some of those people don't because they rather spend their money on bigger cars or bigger houses and so on. But quite a few people feel that it's a very elitist form and quite a few people have no access to it, have no sort of ability to know about it. It's so not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't mind blaming you, sir, but um, I wouldn't blame you. I think you do your very best. But do you have any optimism to think things may get better? Or is it just my normal gloomy idea is that things normally get worse? We just had a talk with John um, at lunchtime, and we we both said there are a lot of singers, even now, who are filling this hall. Why? No, no, I was talking about the audience to come, because here in Britain, um, there isn't much musical education. This is, excuse me, this is what I just said. Yeah. There are some singers who are really filling the hall. Some are not so much filling the hall. Why? Because the audience doesn't know them, um, or maybe it's only the voice which is beautiful and not what is behind the words, what is behind the music. Do you and feel it's because many people have no access to even know about it because they feel it's elitist? Or so what is words? exactly your question? Well, my question is, do you have any optimism to rectify this or do we just accept yes, it? Yes, this is why we are creating competitions like Wigmo Hall and my lead competition. There is Hertogen Bosch, which is also a lead mm. competition. The Academy in Heidelberg. The Academy in Heidelberg that we just created a few years ago with Thomas Hampson together, who's teaching regularly there. And, um, and I'm doing master classes there. And, um, and the festival is really working very, very hard um, to do recitals and install recitals also. I mean, this is where uh, established artists have to work on, um, that, that recitals are really still visited. And it has to do with, how do you say Bildung in English? Knowledge? The knowledge, yeah. Education. Education. Yeah? The, the image, the picture. I think that's very important, and it's a question of education. Every parent is responsible um, to, to give this beauty of poetry to their children. That's very important. It's not always only the schools who are responsible. I mean, it's very easy for, for parents to say, oh, this is the responsibility for the schools, and blah, 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 and I have enough to do, I have not the time. Yes, you should do. My parents did it to me, too. Yeah, I read really with my parents when I was younger. I remember Heine, Harzreise, the Harz journey, and things like that, course, which was many, also funny. Many parents don't have that knowledge either. I mean, it's a generational thing, isn't it? Yeah. I know a lot of young people who love recitals and love these kind mm -hmm. of concerts. It's not only a question of generation. I don't think so. Annie, there's a question down here. Thank you very much. Maestro, well, you've spoken very much, and I think we all agree, that Tishkiska was supreme. How would you rate Clement Frau against him or with him? Because he seems to be very much in the shadow now. No. <laughs> Maybe here, but not in Germany. Yeah. But I must honestly say, um, uh, if you would ask me if I have to choose, um, the deeper intellectual interpretation was, for my taste, Fischer Dieskau. It was not Hermann Prey. And honestly, that's a very personal taste. I think that Fischer Dieskau always had the more beautiful voice than Hermann Prey. Hermann Prey had, especially in the later years, a huge problem, especially if you, if you listened to him live, um, that he was nearly very often out of pitch. And if you have a piano there and the singer is a quarter note lower, to be very honest, it's hard to listen to. I'm going to interject for a second because we've got a few questions coming in from people watching us online. 
Eileen on Instagram has asked, what is the biggest risk you took in your career? To become a jazz singer. <laughs> <laughs> there must have been others. And marriage is also always <laughs> a big risk. But uh, thank, thank God I'm living with my wife now 15 years and very happily together. Mm -hmm. So, And Carol on YouTube has asked, uh, thank you. She says, thank you for your fantastic masterclass on Friday. I think she's in the States. What is your favorite thing about being a teacher? It keeps me young. Mm -hmm. The work with young people, it's not only young in the way of to work with young singers, it's, it's also the challenge. You have to, well, as a teacher, you have so many jobs. You are a vocal teacher, you are a pedagogue, you are a psychologist, you are <laughs> daddy sometimes in a way, mm. yeah? If, if, if students have familiar problems, yes, which, which I have momentarily actual in my class, who have really big, huge family problems, you have to forget that you have now to give the lesson and said, come on, sit down, talk about what, is, what moves you at the moment, where's the problem, maybe. Mm. Maybe it's sometimes you only sit there and listen, which helps. Yes, it yeah? means you don't well. even have permanent a recipe to say you have to do that and that and to avoid these kind of problems. But um, this is what I, what I love in this job really very much to, and to see then the flower growing, like, like Manuel, for example, or Sylvia Schwartz, who sang here too, I think, um, to see that you, that you put this little semen into the ground and it's growing to a flower or a tree. And this is really, really beautiful to see. That's great. Wonderful. We've got time for two more questions from the house itself. Thomas, do you think that young... Hi, my friend. <laughs> cannot be early enough. I think I sang my first Winterreise in front of a public when I was 20, 21. It was not like my last, of course not, but um, I think that every singer needs experience. Singing has a lot to do with trying out, with, with um, um, really trying out how many risks I can take how soft I can sing, how loud I can sing. Um, you have to find out. It, it, and I think as early as you start to taking these risks, um, and this is also a big hello to all the journalists, especially very often you have journalists, if a young singer is on stage, he cannot sing, he's not taking risks, and blah, blah, blah. Where I say, give them time. Time is something which young singers especially needs, which, which they don't have anymore. I mean, we have in Germany this kind of bachelor-master system, which are definitely cutting off the time of, of developing an artist and a voice. And young singers needs time. That's the thing. And as early as they start, as better it is. But they can sing all this repertoire in smaller houses and, and, and of for course. smaller audiences, you and then eventually start, end up here. Yes. You, should, you should not start your recital career in Carnegie Hall. That's very risky. <laughs> yeah, but for example, yeah. this is why we love a hall like this. This is not a 2,000 people hall. By the way, I see it very critical. We don't need permanently this 2,000 people halls. Yeah? It's a very intimate art form recitals and this hall here is perfect for it so one let's last start early one last question yes in the middle here uh, given the importance of china these days to what extent are leader uh, fosters appreciated china in what? china do we have chinese singers what we have coming up through your competition momentarily or? yes i have only in my class four chinese singers who are very, very um, well-educated. They learn very quick German and with incredible voices, more or less. Sometimes you have to teach them, of course, a little bit more 
than other students in style, because there are not so many teachers who know that. But there are huge South Korea, very, very talented, good singers. Constantly coming through in competitions. Yes, constantly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. China is big. Okay. Wait, one very last question then. Somebody here. Were your family um, musical? And is your daughter musical? No. <laughs> <laughs> she loves to listen to music. And by the way, it was really, for me, very beautiful. Um, my wife and my daughter were in the concert two years ago uh, in Albert Hall at Guru Songs, which is not what I would say an easy not piece an easy listen, to no. listen to. Uh, harmonically, yes, but it's long and huge and big. And Charlotte said, oh, wow, it's interesting music. It sounds like film music, which is true in a way. And she very, very early went to concerts. I remember when I had my first huge recital in Verbier Festival. She was six, and she bought with a mother, especially for this event, a white shirt. She looked very beautiful. And I came on stage, and you had to imagine it's a tent with 1,700 people. So I went on stage with Jimmy Levine, by the way, and the only person who stood up and said, Woo! <laughs> in this big hall was my daughter. And I loved it really very much. No, she loves to listen to music, and she is a very talented painter. So, she grows up in this society of artists, so she knows how crazy we are. Okay. Uh, yeah, my father studied music, my mother could play, uh, played piano a little bit, and both were classic lovers. And my father, well, well my father was born in 1927, he's still alive, and when he met my mother, her father said, nice guy, but terrible profession, <laughs> because all the theaters, of course, after the Second World War, were broke. So he learned another business, and um, well, yes. But they were very musical, yes. My brother, too, by the way. He played four instruments very quite well, and um, yeah. So there we have to leave it. Thank you very much for being in the hall. Thank you for joining us online and thank you once again Professor Thomas Quast. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it was beautiful. It was good. Thank you. It was great.